full time. Amen. And the Lord will open up avenues of blessings in every life that comes. Amen. And all our members and all our workers and our leaders who are here tonight, it's wonderful to be together. Amen. I pray that the word of God will enrich every life tonight. Amen. I will not go back home empty handed. I'm talking for myself. I said I will not go back home empty handed. The Lord will fill my life to overflowing. It is done in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. We bless your name for the Bible study. Thank you for every time we always come to the Bible study. You bless your people. The study of your word is a backbone of the believer. I will pray that tonight you make everyone strong in the Lord, in the word, in Jesus' name. Supply the needs of our lives. Open our eyes of understanding. Help us to be all wondrous and wonderful things out of your word in Jesus' name. Supply every need. Take scarcity away from us. Take famine away from us. Let there be abundance in every life. And I pray, Lord, that every one of us will bear fruit in the kingdom in Jesus' name. Confirm the word in every life. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Because you can give me another amen. God bless you. Be seated. We're coming to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Today we're looking at verses 1 all through to 13. John chapter 6 from verse 1. Look at it yourself. It says after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. A great multitude and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there sat with his disciples. And a Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, and saw a great company, that's the multitude, come unto him, he says unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And as he said to prove him, for he knew himself what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's brother, says unto him, There is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. Likewise, also the fishes as much as they would. When they were all filled, how many of them were filled? How many of us are going to be filled? And when they were all filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. That's the passage we're looking at tonight, the story we're considering tonight, and the teaching the Lord is giving us tonight. If you are a student of the Bible, you will understand that this notable miracle has been recorded in all the four Gospels. That means you have it in Matthew, you have it in Mark, you have it in Luke, 
and you have it in John. The question is, why is John writing about this? Because we notice something about the gospel according to St. John. He records the miracles that most of the others did not record. If you look at uh, the turning of water into wine, you find that only in John. And you're thinking about the miracle of that important man who had been sick and paralyzed, incapacitated for 38 years. You find that only in John. And the man that was born blind. And the Lord said, go wash in the pool side Loam. And he came back seeing. You find that only in John. And you think about Lazarus that was raised from the dead. You find that only in John. And look at the nobleman whose son was sick. And Jesus said, thy son liveth. You find that only in John. And so John has peculiarly recorded the messages of the, of the miracles that were not in the other gospels. But why is this that Matthew wrote about this and Mark wrote about this and Luke wrote about this and John is writing about this again? That shows you how important it is, how significant it is, and how essential it is for you to learn and for you to know what the Lord is telling us in this spectacular, unique uh, miracle repeated over and over by Every one of the evangelists that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The thing is, they recorded it from different perspectives. And they want the church, they want the believer to understand and to learn the different lessons that we have. Matthew actually wrote about Jesus Christ as the king. And that's why in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, those people, wise men, came from this. They said, what is he that is born king of the Jews? And when Matthew wrote about uh, this miracle, he was writing about the perfect king who is able to provide adequately for all the people in his kingdom. Matthew is saying, Christ came to establish the kingdom. Is the king of kings and the lord of lords. He came to establish a kingdom that will supply all the needs of the people in that kingdom. And he's inviting you to come into the kingdom. And every need of your life will be supplied even tonight. Every need of your life will be supplied in Jesus' name. And you see what Matthew is doing? is foreshadowing to the king's, uh, the king's abundant provision in the coming millennial kingdom. Matthew is saying uh, Christ is coming to establish his kingdom. And it's going to be a millennial kingdom. And when he comes, it's going to provide for all the needs of humanity. Now we come to Mark. And Mark writes about Jesus Christ in a peculiar way. He wrote about the one that came to serve. As you look at Mark, you're looking at the servant of Jehovah. And Mark wrote about this, and Mark is teaching us of Christ, about the preferred servant of Jehovah. It says, Moses was a servant of Jehovah. And Joshua was a servant of Jehovah. And you're going to find Abraham and David were servants of the Lord. And Jeremiah said they were servants of the Lord. But Mark is saying, I'm telling you about somebody. This is the preferred servant of Jehovah. Greater than Moses and preferred above Moses. Able to feed all his people with earthly and heavenly manner. And now Luke is writing about the same miracle. As you think about Luke, Luke writes about someone that came to represent the Almighty God and to represent the Most High. And Luke is saying, Theophilus, you know what I'm telling you? Somebody came. Angels spoke about his conception. Angels spoke about his birth. And when he came, he came to fully reveal the Almighty God. And he came to show us the proficient representative. The proficient representative of the Almighty who knows no impossibility in meeting the needs of all the people in all dispensations at all times and in all seasons. And now John wants to write. And you know what John is doing? He's telling us about the Son, the only begotten Son of God. He's telling us about the Savior. Here is the Lamb that takes away all the sins of the world. Here is the one that has come 
as our substitute, as a son of God, as a sanctifier. And John is talking about this one who is a powerful son of God, who is the preeminent son of God, who has no rival in history, who has no rival among the Jews, who has no rival in the world, who has no rival since the world began, who has no rival until the end of the world. And so you see, as we look at Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, writing about the same person, about the king, and writing about the servant, writing about the representative, writing about the Son of God. And it shows the different perspectives of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you are reading about this miracle again. And I pray that this miracle will be a manifestation in your life. A demonstration of Christ's presence in your life, even from tonight in Jesus' name. And the perspective of Matthew will be fulfilled in your life. Of Mark fulfilled your life, of Luke fulfilled your life, and now you come and you are listening to John chapter 6. Something great is going to happen in your life. The very Son of God, mighty and powerful, the very Son of God, preeminent and the Almighty, is going to walk mightily in your life tonight in Jesus' name. The title of the Bible study tonight is The Marvel of Christ's Creative Power. The marvel of Christ's creative power. I want you to come back to John chapter 6. And I'm reading some selected verses now. John chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 2. And a great multitude followed him. A great multitude followed him. Why? Because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. That's uh, a verse we're going to, you know, concentrate on. Because it's at the center of the first section. As you're moving on, and you want to get into the depths of this marvel, of the manifestation of the power, manifestation of the might, manifestation of the wisdom, manifestation of the very every attribute of heaven in the Lord Jesus Christ that's the first section and it talks about the multitude look at verse 9 in verse 9 there is a large here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes you see all that multitude they had gathered together and the Lord had been teaching them the word of God the way of the Lord and the wisdom of God and now he needed to feed them before sending them back home he wanted to satisfy their need and there was nothing to satisfy that need but then we're told about a large about a young person that had five barley loaves and two fishes we call that the meal the meal it was the launch of that boy the launch of that young person and he surrendered that to the lord like you are going to surrender your life to the lord and the Lord will multiply the effect of your life, the impact of your life, the influence of your life. You will be so glad you surrender that life to the Lord because your life is going to bless thousands of people. I'm talking to somebody there tonight. Your life will bless millions of people in Jesus' name. Number one, the multitude. Number two, the meal. Number three is the miracle. You find as you come to verse 11. In verse 11, Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. I wish you were one of those disciples. That something will pass from the hand of Jesus to the hand of that disciple there tonight. And then what passes to your hand, you give other people, lives are going to be blessed by you. And the disciples also gave to uh, the people that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. As much as they would. To your satisfaction, they will bless you. As much as they would to your need, they will bless you. And to the cry of your soul, and to the demand that deserve your soul, the Lord will bless you tonight and every time in Jesus' name. That talks about the miracle. The miracle. Number one, the multitude. Number two, the meal. Number three, the miracle. Number one, thirsty 
multitudes searching for Christ. Thirsty multitudes searching for Christ. They were thirsty for something. They were desirous of something. And they wanted something in their lives. And they knew the only place they could find that, the only person that would give them that, and the only personality that could supply that in their lives is the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were searching for Christ. Multitudes, thirsty multitudes, searching for Christ. Number two, a treasured meal. A treasured meal surrendered to Christ. Here was a large, he had his lunch, a packed lunch. The parents are giving that to him because I was going to attend this meeting that Jesus Christ was holding. And should in case you come late, should in case you are hungry, they gave him the meal. And he treasured that until the need came. And when the need came, he gave that to Christ. And then he must have been surprised what Christ did with what he surrendered unto him. You'll be surprised what God will do with your life. As you surrender that life unreservedly, you surrender that life completely, and you surrender that life without any strings attached, and you give it to the Lord, is going to do something that will surprise your family, that will surprise your community, that this single life of yours will be useful beyond your wildest imagination in Jesus' name. A treasured meal surrendered to Christ. Number three, timely miracle. God will not come late in your life. Miracles will not come late in your life. At the nick of time, at the time you need that miracle, miracle of supply, miracle of the supernatural power of God, at that time it will supply that in your life in Jesus' name. Number three, timely miracles supplied by Christ. Timely miracles. Who is going to supply your miracle? I said, who will supply a miracle for you tonight? Timely miracles supplied by Christ. We're coming to number one. Tell me number one there. Thirsty multitudes searching for Christ. We're coming to John chapter John chapter six, and I'm reading from verse one. After these six, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. It's telling us that after Jesus Christ had done all those things we have learnt about in chapter five, the paralytic, impotent man healed, and also all the discussion, revelation about himself as the very son of God revelation of himself as the one that came to, from heaven to do the will of the father revelation of himself as the one that came to reveal the might of the father unto them after those things now he went over where was he going over because it was rich everyone look at him is the lamp of god that taketh away the seas of the world he cannot say in one location he cannot say in one village he cannot stay in one town cannot say in one city he must go to the next place he must go to the next place that's why he went to the next place and if you know you are going to be a blessing to people you're not going to stay in one locality you're not going to stay in just a one spot and you are there every time you are there and then you move on and you move on and you move on because that's what Jesus did and that's what you are going to do you will be a blessing to multitudes in your life in Jesus name I'm coming to, I'm coming to uh, Luke chapter 4 we're looking at Luke chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 42 Luke chapter 4 verse 42 and when it was day he departed and went into a desert place and the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them they wanted to tie him down to one spot they wanted to pin him down to just one locality that he should not depart from them look at verse 43 and he said unto them I must tell me tell me out loud I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also for therefore am I sent 
He said, no, I cannot be tied down here. I cannot be pinned down here. I must go to the next cities. I must reach other cities too. He said, because therefore am I saint. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. We're coming to John chapter 6. And then we're told, as Jesus went over the sea of Galilee. Look at verse 2. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And then when the, when, the miracle, when the multitude came, look at verse 3. And Jesus went up into a mountain and there sat with his disciples. He's telling us he took the position now, the position of the master, the position of the teacher, the position of the preacher, because the multitudes had come. He was going to preach the word unto them. In verse 4, we're told about the time, the period, the season among the Jewish people and the Passover, a feast of the Jews was very near. Doesn't that tell you something? We shouldn't allow our preaching, our teaching, our our ministry, our administration, our reaching out to souls, as, uh, our soul winning to be hindered by whatever festival may be going on in any community. It's Christmas time, some people are concentrating on a particular thing. It's Easter time, some people are concentrating on something. It's harvest time, the people are concentrating. It's the opening of the schools, like the sessions are starting. They're concentrating on something else. It is a holiday time, festival time. Whatever time it is, you see what Jesus did. The Passover was very near, but he knew there is something important that must be done every time, every time. And so whatever month of the year, whatever season of the year, the Lord has given us an assignment, a duty, a responsibility. And we're going to carry it out every time in Jesus' name. There is no excuse for laziness. There's no excuse for shirking your duty. There's no excuse for abandoning the work he has given you to do. Whatever the season, whatever the festival, whatever the period, we move on and we go on following the example of Jesus Christ, doing what he has done, and the Lord will bless the work in your hand in Jesus' name. Now we come to verse 2. And a great multitude followed him. It says, because... They saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Now you need to understand something. That's all they knew. They were sick. They knew that he had been healing the sick. And they had challenges of deformity or whatever in their body. And they knew that he could help them. They didn't know about righteousness. They didn't know about holiness. They didn't know about salvation. They didn't know about heaven. They didn't know about the fact that he had come so that he can take their sins away. They didn't know that the most important thing is that he must be born again. Except he might be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. All they knew is that they were sick and they wanted healing. All they knew is that they were oppressed and they wanted deliverance. All they knew is that they were in need and they wanted a supply. And that teaches us that whatever recent people may have in coming to the Lord, they came for healing, that's good. They came for deliverance, that's good. They came for miracles, that's all right. Or they came for maybe investigation. We've been hearing about this Christ. Who is he? Is he like John the Baptist? Is he different from John the Baptist? Is he the prophet that is to come? Is he the Messiah? Is he the Christ? Some people came for investigation. Other people came for confirmation. We'll be hearing what uh, they said uh, Christ has been doing. And we came to confirm for confirmation. Other people may come out of curiosity. This one they said is uh, doing this and doing that. Is this for real? Is this genuine? Are these miracles real? Are they true? They came out of curiosity, but somehow they were thirsty. Somehow they wanted something. Somehow they were desirous to make their need, to have their needs met. You know what Jesus did? He went from the known to the unknown. They knew their needs of being healed. And he went from that, he went to their need of having the watch of God in them. 
of having salvation, of having eternal life. That's what we preachers ought to do. The people don't know they need salvation. What do they think they need? They need healing. Talk about healing. Give the healing to them and then from healing cross over and talk about salvation. The people don't know they need heaven but they want happiness. Go from that happiness and then go to the eternal happiness and go to how to get to heaven. The people don't know that they need sanctification but they know that they want success. Go from that success and then go to salvation and sanctification. He gave them what they ought to have. Whatever was the reason for coming, he preached to them. He saw the multitude, he preached. He saw the multitude, he taught them. He saw the multitude, he aroused their interest in the real needs of their lives in salvation in eternal life. Let me show you. Let me show you. We're looking at Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 because I told you that Mark recorded this and then you're going to see what Jesus did with the multitude. We're looking at Mark chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 33. Mark chapter 6, verse 33. And Jesus, are you there? I, I said, are you there? That is, are you in Mark chapter, chapter 6, verse 33. And the people saw them departing. And many knew him and ran a foot thither out of all the cities and out of uh, and, and they outwent them and came together unto him. Look at verse 34 now. And Jesus, when he came out and saw, tell me, much people, multitude, he saw the multitude, and he was moved with compassion toward them because they were sheep having no, having no shepherd, not having a shepherd. And he began, tell me what he did. Tell me out loud. And he began to teach them many things. It's so much people. It's so much people. As you look at this chapter, you will know he's talking about the same thing about when he fed the 5,000. Look at verse 39. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. We were talking about the same people. Look at verse 44. And they did eat of the loaves. They that did eat of the loaves were about, tell me the number, 5,000 men. He's talking about the same thing. And he said, he saw that multitude. And when he saw the multitude, they came for healing, teach them. They came for deliverance, teach them. They came for miracle, teach them. And lead them to life eternal. We're coming to chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house, and straightway many were gathered together. That's multitude, that's multitude. Every time they heard that Jesus Christ was around, they all came because of their felt needs, because of their sicknesses, because of their bondages, because of the yoke, and because of the curse, the, the curse they wanted to get rid of. It says, and straightway many were gathered together, in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And what did he do? Tell me out loud. He preached the word unto them. It's not only healing. Not only healing. Yes, they came for healing. And he's going to do that. It was a multitude. They needed to repent. They needed the word of repentance. They also needed the word of faith in Christ. They needed the word of salvation. And the word of eternal life. They needed to be born again. And so, even though they came for something else, he knew the greatest thing he could do for them is to preach the word word of God to them and look at verse 13 in verse 13 of that chapter 2 and he went forth again by the seaside and all the multitude resorted unto him what did he do? And he taught them, and he taught them. Anywhere you see people, anywhere you see multitudes, anywhere you see crowd, you do what Jesus Christ did. You will not say, well, they don't know about salvation. Tell them. They don't know about repentance. Tell them. They don't know about righteousness. Tell them. They don't know about the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Tell them. They're only asking for healing. Yes, give them the word of healing and give them the word of salvation. 
They are only asking for deliverance. Give them the word and the message of deliverance and give them also the message of life eternal. We're coming to Mark chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 32. Mark chapter 3 and verse 32. Mark chapter 3, verse 32. And the multitude sat about him. You see that again? They were always around him. Multitudes, a crowd. Many people, much people, they always came. And it says, the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold thy mother and thy brethren, without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat with him, and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, that's what he was teaching them. Whosoever shall do the will of God, that's what he was revealing to them. Whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. And so you understand that Jesus Christ, anytime he saw the multitude, he did something. He preached, he taught the word of God, and he revealed to them the way of salvation. That's what Matthew also tells us. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verses 2 and 3. Matthew chapter 13, verse 2. It says, and great multitudes, you know, they were always gathering around him. Because miracles attract multitudes. If you have the power of God, and then you have the Holy Ghost, and thank God you have. I say, thank God you have. You say, but I'm uh, not a walking miracle. There are many people that have pen and paper and they are not writing. There are many people that have brain and they are not using. And there are many people that have books and they are not reading. There are many people that have food and they are not eating. There are many people that have, uh, you know, good houses to live in and they are not living there. That you are not uh, perform miracle doesn't know, mean that you don't have the power. The power is there. It will come out. I said it will come out. You see, Jesus Christ knew that miracles attract multitudes. And because of that, he performed those miracles. But it was a means to an end. He performed those miracles so that they will come to him and then they will teach them the word of life. Look at verse 2. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and he sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore and he spake many things unto them in parables. He spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, Israel went forth to sow. He was teaching them. He might teach with illustration. Or he might teach with picture. Or he might teach with parable. Or he might teach in direct statement. It was still teaching. Look at verse 34. In verse 34 of that same uh, chapter, it says in verse 34, all these seeds speak Jesus unto the, tell me, multitude in parables, and without a parable speaking not unto them, that it may be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things that have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. I will mention things, declare things, proclaim things, and teach them things that were hidden for them, kept secret from the foundation of the world. We're coming to chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, and I'm reading from verse 31. Matthew chapter 22, verse 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, Ye have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Verse 33. And when the multitude heard this, they were there, multitudes. He was teaching them, teaching them about God. God and is the God of power, God of life and resurrection and the God who is able to bring eternal life to everyone that will believe. It says when the multitude had this they were astonished at his doctrine. We are coming to Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6 
He was uh, teaching them again. Uh, remember, that's what he always did with multitudes. He didn't just say, uh, you know, look at the multitudes and entertain them. He didn't look at the multitudes and just joke with them. Never. He didn't look at the multitude and just excite them uh, and talk about, uh, you know, historical religion or whatever. He came to reveal to them the, the very depths of the knowledge of things from heaven. Luke chapter 6, verse 17. Uh, and he came down with them uh, and stood in the plain and the company of the disciples and a great a great a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon which came uh, to hear him what did they come to do they came to hear him I said what did they come to do they came to hear him. They heard the teaching, evangelistic message. They heard the teaching, you know, a kind of free teaching that will turn their lives around, transformational message, and also to be healed of their diseases. It is still the same today. And look at the result. Look at the result. If we look at multitudes today, think about this as God is going to give us the power. I said, as God is going to give you the power, and over there you have a multitude, you are talking to them. Over there I have the multitude, I'm teaching them. Over there you have the multitude, you are revealing the mind of God to them. Multitude here, and multitude here, multitude here, and each of us here, you can touch multitudes. I said, each of us here, we can touch multitudes. If you believe God can do anything and everything with you, where are you there? You touch their lives in Jesus' name. Uh, let me show you the end result of that. I go to them, you go to them, I reach them, you reach them, I teach them, you teach them. I'm preaching to them, you are preaching to them. Uh, and then multitude here, multitude there, multitude everywhere. Look at the final result. I'm looking at uh, Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 9. After this I beheld a great multitude. All the people were preached to, they are going to come in. They'll come into the kingdom. They're going to be saved. They'll be healed. Praise the Lord. They'll be delivered. Praise the Lord. Their needs are going to be met. Praise the Lord. Not only that, they're going to be saved in Jesus' name. Multitudes. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. Think about that. When you are productive and not productive. When you are profitable and, pro and, and profitable. And when you are reaching multitudes and I'm reaching multitudes. When you bring everyone together. A great multitude that no one could number. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. Stood before the throne. They will get to heaven. Your converts will get to heaven. My converts will get to heaven. The multitudes who are reaching and touching will get to heaven in Jesus' name. Before the throne and before the Lamb, clothes were white robes and palms in their hands. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and upon the lambs. Your converts will be among these people. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders, and the four bees fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God saying Amen somebody shout Amen, amen. blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever Amen, amen. Uh, look at look at verse 17 for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Hey, those are the people in the multitude. Here they listen to the word of God from you, from me, from us. And then they came to the kingdom of God. And when we get to the other side, the multitude will be waiting in Jesus' name. We're coming back to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And now we're reading from verse 5. John chapter 6. 
We're reading from verse 5. This is the second point now. In verse 5, it tells us, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company, that's the multitude, come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Many times uh, the Lord might be asking you a question, but the question is not actually for you to teach the Lord. It's to test you. It's to test your faith. It's to uh, make you bring out all that you have been learning. If you can say that, well, you can do all things because they had learned from the Lord that with God all things are possible. They have heard from the Lord. If thou canst only believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. They have learned from the Lord that he can do all things. And now when Jesus asked Philip, he didn't, uh, you know, remember what he had been learning. I pray that when the question comes to you, about your life, you remember what you have been learning. Is this one possible? You remember what you have been learning. Can this sickness be healed? You remember what you have been learning. In this time of recession and joblessness, unemployment, can you still feed your family? You will remember what you have been learning. At this time of difficulty and challenge, when there is nothing to cater for anybody at all, can the Lord supply your need and make your cup to be full and overflowing? You remember the promise of God. And so he asked Philip, he said, how are we going to do it? When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And then this is said to prove him, to test him. For he himself knew what he will do. Jesus knows what he will do in your life. He may ask you a question, but he knows what he will do in your family. He may ask you a question, but he knows how he's going to provide for you. And he knows how the thing will come and it's going to come. I said blessings are going to come. And even though he might be asking you questions, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a clue. He doesn't know what he's going to do. You know, sometimes when I'm preaching, I'll be asking you a question, and I say, what chapter are we? Or oh, somebody said, the pastor has forgotten the chapter. No, I didn't forget. I'm testing you. Are you a good class? And you always get the answer? And you will always get the answer. Hey, look at this now. We're looking at it in verse, in verse 7. And Philip answered him, 200 penny walls of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. But you are not going to take just a little. It will fill you to overflowing. It will fill you to satisfaction. Tonight is your night. You will not escape the miracle of God. And, and one of his disciples, Andrew, uh, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. The answer was in the hand of that lad. The answer was in the hand of that little boy. Many times you don't understand. Many times you don't know the answer is there in your hand. The solution is there in your hand. It will take that little thing that you have. It will bless it. It will break it. It will multiply it. And you are going to have abundant supply in Jesus' name. And then, but uh, Andrew said, but what are these? What are they among so many? But Jesus had got what he needed. So Jesus said in verse 10, make the men sit down. Now, there was so much, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in the number. Uh, uh, the number was about, what's the number? 5,000. Let us look at something here. A treasured meal surrendered to Christ. A treasured meal surrendered to Christ. If you know who children are, you know that children are selfish generally. Children think about themselves. Th children, they think of what I have now, and they don't know if I miss this, if I lose this, am I going to get a replacement? And children are grasping. Children hold on to what they have, and they don't want to ever give it up. They have a toy, they don't want to give that up. They have a meal, they don't want to share that. They, anything they have, they want to hold. But this large... He had given his heart to the Lord. And because of that, selfishness had been taken away. 
grasping has been taken away. Avarice had been taken away. Covetousness had been taken away. Selfishness, self-centeredness had been taken away. Holding on to what I have, I cannot give up. I cannot give anybody. I cannot share this one. All that was gone. You see, if you're going to be like that, the first thing for you is to give your heart to the Lord. Once you give your heart to the Lord, the rest is easy. The rest of your treasure, you'll understand. If I can pass my heart, if I can uh, surrender my heart unto the Lord, and everything I have, I surrender to the Lord, there's going to be a multiplication in your life. Give me go to Ikeja, amen. Multiplication for Ikeja. Multiplication for every family. And abundance is going to come to your life. As you surrender your heart, surrender your life to the Lord, and you say, I'm not going to hold back anything. A change will come to you. Selfishness is gone. Your heart is giving to the Lord, and your treasure is giving to the Lord. You know, somebody said, uh, they use this language. Uh, let me use the language for you. It will embarrass you with miracle. He'll pour it and pour it and pour it upon you. It will never come to an end in Jesus' name. We're coming to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 26. Proverbs chapter 23. Verse 26. My son, give me thine heart. That's where to start. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. My son, give me thine heart. You see what that lad had done? That lad had given his heart unto the Lord and so to give the meal that lad did not know what will happen to the meal because a miracle like this was happening for the first time in his lifetime a miracle like this was happening for the first time among the disciples of the Lord they didn't know that there would be any multiplication and the child did not know even though he did not know he said it's good to give it to Jesus it's good to pass it on to the hands of Jesus. It's good that something that was in my hand, something in my possession, will pass on to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Think about this, that God can make use of the little me and the little things I have, and I can pass that on to the great king, to the preferred king, to the son of God. And he can use his supernatural power and do whatever he wants to do. I will not ask any question. I'm going to pass this on. And indeed, multiplication came in his life. You know, that, that's the, that's the uh, principle of scripture. Let me show you how it happens. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 28. 1 Samuel chapter, tell me. Chapter 1, verse, tell me the verse. Verse 28. In 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 28. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. And as, uh, as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worship the Lord. There, he's talking about Anna, the mother of Samuel. Uh, you know mothers, you know mothers. Mothers who have been looking for children for many, many years. And uh, there was no child. And the husband, being uh, an unbeliever, went to marry another person that will give uh, him children. And the other one, Penina, was, you know, troubling and provoking Anna all the time. You have no child. You are the first woman, you don't have no child, no child. And yet, eventually, this woman, Anna, she prayed and she cried to the Lord. And God gave her a child, this only child. You know what mothers do? They want to keep that child. They want, that child will stay with them. And they'll be looking at the face of the child. And anything, they won't allow you to correct the child. They won't allow you to bring up the child. They won't allow you to train the child. Because this my only son. I know the prayer I prayed. I know the fasting I did. I know everything I did to get this child. But you know what Anna did? She gave that child to the Lord. The only child. And there was no other child yet. But look at what God did. When you give something to the Lord, a multiplication will come in your life. I'm talking to somebody there. Multiplication. Multiplication of miracle. Multiplication of supply. Multiplication of heaven investment in your life in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 2 now. Look at chapter 2, verse 21. Chapter 2, verse 21. And see what God did for her. This is what he will do for you. And the Lord visited Anna. Your visitation time has come. Heaven will visit you. 
God will visit you himself. And, and the Lord visited Anna so that she conceived and bear, tell me, three sons and tell me more and two daughters. Look at that. She gave Samuel to the Lord. She didn't hold on and say, this one I have. I don't know whether another one will come or not. No, nothing will happen to this one. I'm going to keep this one. She gave to the Lord. When you give to the Lord, there's always a miracle of multiplication. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. We're coming to uh, the word of God here. And uh, we're reading from First Kings, First Kings chapter 6. 17. First Kings chapter 17. Give, it shall be given unto you. You are tired of amen? Yeah. In First Kings chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called unto her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. You know, people have at a the time, they've lost their job. You know how people are? They've lost their husbands. You know how people are? There's unemployment. You know how people are? There's famine. You know how people are? When there's recession, it's like they're touchy. They are bad temper. And if anybody calls on them, because they don't know when any meal will come tomorrow. And this is the last meal that she has. And she's going to cook that so that she will eat that and get ready for death. And there was nobody to help. The relatives of the husbands that, you know, had died, those relatives did not know that, you know, they're anywhere. And they're not looking at them. And here comes the prophet of God and said, fetch me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it without any comment. Think about that. Good temper. Good about, think about that, a good attitude. God will give you that kind of attitude. That you don't know what is coming. And you don't know why we're asking you for a cup of water. You don't know why we're asking you to do what, you ought, what we're saying that you should do. But we're telling you so that the Lord will bring miracles into your life in Jesus' name. And then he says, as she was going to fetch it, uh, he, he called unto her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that, I, that we may eat it and tell me, we may eat it and, and die, but you will not die. You will not die of famine. You will not die of joblessness. You will not die of unemployment. The point is, give your heart to the Lord and give your treasure unto the Lord. If you will give your treasure to the Lord, He will multiply miracles in your life in Jesus' name. And Elijah said unto her in verse 13, fear not. And I come to tell you tonight, fear not. No job, fear not. No employment, fear not. There's no food at home, fear not. Manna will come once again. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thyself and thy son. Look at the prophecy coming into your life. For thou says the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste. Neither shall the cross of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. Somebody there will be obedient tonight. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat. And they ate how many? many days and the barrel of meal wasted not neither did the cross of oil fail according to the word of the lord which is spake by elijah you know what we need to be teaching our young people today the subject of giving giving we need to teach the children. You know, sometimes uh, we teach uh, these children 
great, great subjects. And you're learning the chemistry, the physics, the mathematics, and home economics, and everything, uh, engineering. But they are not learning a single judge, a single word, a single principle on giving. And I'm telling you, if they learn the subject of giving, giving sacrificially, that subject will do more for them than all the subjects who are teaching them in school. Because all those things who are teaching them, they get a job, they get money, they get house, they get this, they get that, but they're selfish. They're self-centered. They're not giving anything. They're not going to go far, far in life. But if we teach them the subject of giving, look at this lad. There's a lad here that has five loaves and two fishes. And then he surrendered his heart, surrendered that thing, you know, unto uh, the disciples. And they gave to Jesus. And there's the record of this young man now in the book of God and also in the book of life. Your children will get to the book of life. Not only that, we need to teach this doctrine, the doctrine of sacrificial giving to new converts and also to Christians and to all believers and to all ministers. This doctrine is so important because it brings unlimited blessings in all areas of lives unto us. But you see there are people who are not taught this doctrine at all, this teaching at all of sacrificial giving. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 10. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, and, and that there may be meat in mine house, and probe me now herewith, says the Lord, if I will not open the windows of heaven. Windows of heaven are about to open upon you. But you know what you should do? You give your heart to the Lord and you give your treasure to the Lord. Give your house for the service of the Lord. Give your land for the service of the Lord. Give your money to the service of the Lord. Give your treasure to the Lord. It says, bring it, bring it. Bring ye the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And probe me now herewith, it says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Outpouring is coming. That there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast a fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Give me a kaja, amen there. Yeah. And all nations and all nations and all nations shall call you blessed. For ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of host. Uh, let, let's understand. In fact, there's something to do. Let me show you something. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And I'm reading from verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, ye you know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Addiction. Addiction. They could not stop giving. They could not stop rendering service. They could not stop just giving and giving and giving sacrificially. And they gave with love. They gave with excitement. They gave with happiness. They addicted themselves to the service of the saints. And look at this boy we're talking about. He gave. He gave a treasured meal and he gave that to Christ, surrendered that to Christ, and a blessing came upon multitudes. Your life is going to be profitable. But you know, you must give your treasure. You must give your time. You must give your talent. You must give your knowledge. You must give your ability. You must give your learning. You must give your enthusiasm. You must give some joy. You must give everything that you have. That little thing you have, you give, you give, you give. And then God will take that. Christ will take that. And then he'll multiply that. And he will bless many lives in this, our generation. And you are, you are one of the people that God is going to use. And you're going to be a blessing to multitudes in Jesus' name. While Andrew is wondering where we're going to get bread, the Lord said, you can get my own. And while Philip is saying, where well, we're going to have nourishment for all this multitude, the Lord said, here am I. If this one will do something, you, know, you can take this one. And Jesus took that. Do you have something to give today? I said, do you have something to give today? 
You know, it's like we should even give you another opportunity to still give offering even today. If we were to do that, I'm telling you, you will supply the needs of many generations. And then, look at that, look at that, look at that. Everybody ate, all the men ate out of that little meal. And all the, all the children ate out of that little meal. And all the women ate out of that little meal. They came from different cities. They came from different places. And the life of that little lad touched all the people. And they said, I never ate any food as delicious like that before. And they're talking about this. Jesus blessed me a miracle food, miracle meal that I ate today. And the origin and the source is from that lad. That source of blessing will be you. Yeah. And then uh, how many, how much uh, did they gather afterwards? I said, how many baskets did they gather afterwards? Supply and surplus, supply and surplus, and satisfaction, and that thing will come through your life. And as you give, more will be given to you in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, timely miracles supplied by Christ. Timely miracles supplied by Christ. We're looking at John, John chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 11. John chapter 6, verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that sat down and likewise uh, the fishes as much as they would. As much as they would. As much as they would. Blessings coming as much as you would. I said blessings coming as much as you would. Supply coming as much as you would. And it says, and when they were filled, and when they were filled, nobody was hungry, nobody was in need, nobody faced scarcity, no farming, local farming, community farming, national farming, everything Jesus took care of. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore, Therefore, they gathered them together and filled, how many baskets? Twelve baskets were frag the fragments of the five loaves which remained over and above, over and above unto them that had eaten. What are we learning from that? We're looking at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 19. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Can it happen again? Yes. Can it happen today? Yes. Can it happen to you? Yes. My God shall supply all your needs. Yes. According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Understand? He supplies all our needs. Material needs he'll supply. Yes. Physical needs he'll supply. Family needs will supply. Domestic needs will supply. Spiritual needs will supply. And professional needs will supply. Temporary needs today will supply. Our eternal needs until you cross over to the other side. It will keep on supplying, supplying, supplying in your life. In Jesus' name. For my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We're looking at Psalm 37. Psalm 37. And I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 37. And we're reading from verse 3. Psalm 37 verse... Psalm 37 verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the, you see that boy? He trusted in the Lord and he did good. You will do good. You do good to your neighbors. You do good to your, uh, to your countrymen. You do good to people around you. Trust the Lord and do good. So shall thou dwell in the land. And verily, and verily, and verily tell me, thou shalt be fed. He will feed you. He feeds the sparrows. He will feed you. You might be a widow, but he'll feed you. You might be an orphan, but he'll feed you. 
It might be somebody that is lonely. You don't know where something will come from. A miracle will come to your life. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. And thou, so shalt thou dwell in the land. Verily thou shalt be fed. De delight thyself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Desires of thine heart. You are not married yet. Desires of your heart will come. You don't have children yet, desires of your heart will come. You don't have a job yet, desires of your heart will come. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and it shall bring it to pass. And ye shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, rest in the Lord, rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Look at verse 19. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. You will not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, in the days of famine, in the days of recession, in the days of unemployment, in the days of joblessness, in the days of insecurity, you will be satisfied. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health unto thy neighbor. It will heal you. It will take sickness away from the midst of you. It says it shall be health to thy neighbor and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance. That's what that lad did. He gave his treasured meal, treasured lunch unto the Lord, and the Lord multiplied that and became a great blessing. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thy increase, so shall thy bonds be filled with plenty. And thy presses shall burst out with new wine. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, we're reading from verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 6. He feels so spiritually. He feels us materially. He feels us providentially. He feels us with everything we need. And it says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for thee. For thee. He'll fill you with righteousness. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Chapter 6 verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. All these things shall be added unto you. Healing will be added. Prosperity will be added. The goodness of the Lord will be added. The joy of the Lord will be added. Your life will be full. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 19, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, Ephesians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 19, it says, and to know the love of God, you know the love of God today, that pass, which passes on knowledge, and that ye might be filled, that she might be filled, that she might be filled with all the fullness of God, now unto him that is able. Is your God able tonight? Yes. Brother dear, I said, is your God able tonight? Yes. My sister, my daughter there, is your God able tonight? Yes. Can he turn your sorrow into joy? Yes. Can he turn your weeping into laughter? Yes. Can he take that shame away and reproach away from your life? Yes. Can he turn everything around tonight? Yes. Can he provide for you tonight? Yes. Because it says, now unto him that is able to do, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that walketh, that walketh, that walketh, walketh in me, walketh in us, walketh in you, it will walk in you. 
unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without age. And everybody said, Amen. Rise up and tell the Lord you're expecting tonight, you're expecting tonight. The multitudes came. And when the multitudes came, maybe they came for healing. Maybe they came for deliverance. But he gave them teaching. He gave them doctrine. He gave them instruction. He gave them the word of God. And that word of God has come to you today. And he has told you what to do. The word of God has come to you today. And that word is enriching your life. If you are not saved, there's a time to be saved. If you have not repented, there's the time to repent and if you have not gone into the righteousness of the Lord this is the time to be thirsty and this is the time to seek the face of the Lord and to hunger and thirst after righteousness and allow him to fill you with that righteousness and as you hear the word of God you understand that treasure that thing you have you give your heart to the Lord you give your treasure to the Lord you give everything you have to the Lord there will be a multiplication a multiplication at the miracle power of God God will walk unhindered, unrestricted, unlimited in your life. Open your mouth, talk to the Lord in prayer. It's your day of blessing.